So as mentioned, I'm going to talk about analytic projects. I'm a professor at Stanford University and we have both a children's hospital and an adult hospital. And I'm gonna talk about projects that we have done at our children's hospital. Uh, and I've, the subtitle of this talk is Successes, Failures and Opportunities. I think that hindsight is 2020, uh, kind of like Max's talk, looking back, what are our lessons learned? So I'm gonna talk about things that did and didn't work. Um, so uh, I'm gonna give an overview of our projects, some successes and failures in several different areas that I will discuss, uh, some lessons learned and some concluding thoughts. So our children's hospital is called Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, Stanford. It's a pediatric academic medical center. We have, it has 360 beds. We've just renovated it. So that's the new hospital. Uh, it's a level one trauma facility. So we handle a lot of trauma. We have about 13,000 admissions per year, about 6,600 surgeries per year at our hospital. Um, I was gonna talk about challenges, but let's change this into a positive way as opportunities at our hospital. And I'm abbreviating Lucille Packard Children's Hospital as LPCH. So we believe that as an academic medical center, we provide cutting edge clinical care. And I think we really do. However, we know that like other healthcare systems in our country, uh, we have waste and inefficiency. And Institute of Medicine report said that about 30 to 40 cents of every healthcare dollar in the US covers the cost of overuse, underuse, misuse, duplication, system failures, et cetera. So just, we know that we're probably wasting just as other people are. More than that, we think we have outmoded management systems. Now I wanna emphasize this is not how we keep our patient records. This is really just meant to be illustrative, but we do think that in terms of efficiency and management, we can do a better job. And so the goal of our projects is to use practice-based evidence to empower data-driven clinical and operational decisions. To give an example of what I mean, this is a picture of our surgeon, Dr. Hawley, who is performing a very specialized pediatric heart surgery. Our hospital can uh, perform a specialized surgery to repair heart defects in newborns. And it's one of the few hospitals in the world that can do this. The average wait for this surgery is about 11 months. Uh, before the surgery happens, there are about 11 hour, 100 hours of imaging and the surgery itself takes 18 hours. This work is as technically complex and coordinated as anything NASA does. It's like rocket science. However, so I've told you about the, you know, the technology, but the scheduling for this procedure is still done in a big leather book with sticky notes. So for example, if the, if the procedure is canceled, you know, the child got the flu or something, it's very difficult to quickly create a new schedule. And so this picture highlights the shortcomings of us using old technology, our manual scheduling book, to support new technology, which is super sophisticated surgery. So we created a, uh, a collaboration called SURF, uh, which stands for Systems Utilization Research for Stanford Medicine. It's really because my collaborator is a surfer and he really wanted to get that as the acronym. Um, but it's a collaboration between the hospital, the School of Medicine and my department, the Department of Management Science and Engineering. So our aim is to facilitate the delivery of these cutting edge advances in healthcare through advances in hospital operations. And we use a range of analytical techniques, uh, machine learning, optimization, simulation, et cetera. Um, so a little bit about our projects. We've been doing this for about three years now. All our teams include the hospital analytics director, a clinical partner, uh, students, always have students, uh, and some project teams include a faculty member from management science and engineering, for example, me. Uh, and the projects that we've done range from one academic quarter, because remember these are students, to several years. Um, here's a picture showing an overview of our projects from uh, patient access to procedures and diagnostics, uh, hospital beds and discharges, as well as decision support. Uh, and we're just doing a variety of things like uh, telemedicine, developing an iPhone app for children who have to manage their diabetes at home. And I'm gonna talk about some of these projects. 
a uh, number of things to support these operating room and surgical procedures, et cetera. Number of things related to hospital inpatients. We also have things where we're trying to forecast hospital um, census and then overarching, like trying to automate workload, et cetera, workload balancing. I mean, so I'm going to talk about a few of these projects in the context of successes, failures, and opportunities. So first of all, um, you know, Max uh, talked just, just now, we had a nice slide about what makes a good OR project. We've got a similar slide. We think that a good project is one that achieves sustained value. And we think there are four steps. The first is stakeholder buy-in. This could fail if physicians, administrators, or other people do not engage. Um, so, okay, you have stakeholder holder buy-in, then you need to solve the technical problem. Of course, if you can't do that, the project will fail. Then, of course, you want the solution to be implemented. Uh, sometimes that doesn't happen if the project's too complex, it disrupts workflows, many other reasons. Once it's implemented, of course, you'd like the project to be sustained. Um, and of course, that may not happen if it's too difficult to maintain, et cetera. And finally, our, our definition of success is sustained measured value. Uh, and like what Max also just said, measurement is important. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these stages and some of the lessons we have learned. So stakeholder buy-in, um, most of our projects, we didn't have a problem with this because David is a director of analytics for the hospital. So um, people come to him and say, I have a problem, help me. But nonetheless, so to, to achieve buy-in, we need to create and maintain working partnerships. So we work in project teams, uh, as I mentioned. Um, to select a project, it's very important that it matches the priorities of the institution and a project where analytics can add value. Um, so what we found is useful is to identify a small group of physicians or administrators who are passionate about analytics. So you don't want to start working with someone who says, what is machine learning? Why do I care? You want to start with someone who has a, who thinks that you might be able to do something. Um, another thing we've learned is to start with a project that has a, a technically modest initial goal that's focused. So for example, one project we did, we just used machine learning to predict how long surgeries would take. Well, once that was successful and people saw that that was a good thing, then we use those predictions to uh, schedule the operating room. So a bigger project. Um, very important, as was previously mentioned as well, discuss the project with a wide range of stakeholders. So in our hospital, it would be people from human resources, process improvement, information services, et cetera. So that's a little bit about achieving stakeholder buy-in. Now, what about solving the technical problem? So for each of these three last points, I'm going to give you a project, tell you about a project that didn't work so well and a project that did. Because remember, part of the uh, part of what I want to talk about is things that didn't work. So first project I want to talk about is identifying patients at risk of clinical decline. As you know, patients in the hospital are hooked up to all kinds of monitors. So our thought was we want to predict when a patient is going to have a clinical de decline from the waveform data that's on these monitors. And clinical decline means some sort of crisis event, you know, blood pressure drops precipitously, whatever it is. Um, so we have a lot of data. We have uh, very dense waveform data, about 125 samples per second. We have data on 38,000 patients for over almost a decade. It's 35 terabytes of data. So this is a super data intensive problem. So we thought, well, we could use this data to predict clinical decline. But it turns out that the kind of thing we're trying to predict are pretty rare. But more than that, when we looked at the data, there was a lot of gaps and noise. And this is actually a picture of data from a patient, uh, three different monitors, uh, electrocardiogram, I don't know what that is, and breathing. But there's gaps, okay? So this, another challenge was that there's massive amounts of data. So we realized that in fact, before we could do anything, we couldn't do what we wanted to do. So we created a new goal to improve the waveform data. So we developed a model that would reconstruct the missing data from the patient's data. 
So this is an example. So we use a, a, an imputation type of method and machine learning. Uh, and we developed a very generic technique to analyze and extract information. So looking at my scorecard of technical solution implemented and sustained, this particular problem, we didn't solve the, tech, the problem technically, we solved a different problem and published it here. Um, now, a project that did work. Central line acqu acquired bloodstream infections, also known as CLABSIs, are, uh, can happen when someone has a central line and uh, an infection happens. So we would like to predict that from the patient data. Well, similar to the previous project, um, th these CLABSIs are rare. So because it was rare, we pivoted to a new goal, which is just, let's see what we're doing at our hospital. What are the clinical practices? Um, so we looked at access guidelines. It turns out they're well-established guidelines, like when you need to, add, to um, draw samples or add medication. Sometimes you use a central line, sometimes a peripheral line, uh, and sometimes only the central line should be used. So we looked at three years of data on what we did at our hospital and looked at whether the access was appropriate. And turned out that half of all access to the, the central lines in our hospital was inappropriate. Hospital leadership didn't know about this. They were super excited that a simple change could help prevent these infections. So um, we actually made a dashboard of different parts of the hospital. Uh, it's been in use for, I don't know, a year and a half now. And basically saying, are you doing the right thing? Did you needlessly change the connector, et cetera? Uh, so for this project, we did solve the technical problem. And uh, so that's an example of one that was successful. Now implementation. Um, scheduling surgical procedures. This is a picture of one of our operating rooms. Again, you can see technologically super advanced. Um, our goal was to schedule surgical procedures to minimize the congestion downstream in the post anesthesia care unit. When children leave the operating room, they have to go recover from the anesthesia in the post anesthesia care unit. And it turned out that was a bottleneck and we actually had uh, patients who had to sit in the bed waiting for um, uh, a bed to be available. So we decided we solved the problem in this way. We use machine learning for each surgical procedure to estimate what is the recovery time. Then we used integer programming to schedule the procedures, and then we simulate it to look at our new schedule. So the machine learning, we wanna predict how long the recovery duration will be. Turned out it worked pretty well. And some of the main features that were important was procedure type, the weight and age of the child, interestingly. Uh, so we predicted the recovery duration. Then we put that into an integer program uh, two integer programs. In fact, the first one, we schedule procedures to minimize the ending time of each operating room using case length estimates. Then those ending times will be constraints in our second integer program, uh, which then we schedule our procedures to minimize the maximum post anesthesia care unit occupancy. Uh, so then we simulated. Uh, so we compared the optimized schedule to the actual schedule. And it turns out the optimized schedule had the same operating room utilization, but it would have reduced the holds in the operating room due to, to congestion in the post anesthesia care unit by 76%. Um, now talking about implementation. So we solved the technical problem. What about implementation? So the way implementation would work is the IT department would give data on what the procedures are and upload it to, uh, for each day. Then the scheduling nurse would look at that, put it into her laptop. We actually have it available on a laptop and then send back any changes that had to be made. Uh, well, it turned out this was super time intensive. So in fact, we, we're not able to implement this. And this particular project is on hold. So the project was solved. We know how to solve it. 
but we have it on hold while we figure out how to get the electronic health record and the data interface working. Uh, we published this paper recently in Healthcare Management Science describing this project. Uh, infusion center scheduling. So these are children who have to have uh, infusions for cancer and other things. So our goal, and this is a picture of our infusion center. We wanna create a scheduling system that will maximize the bed utilization. We have seven of these beds. Um, we wanna be able to accommodate scheduled and walk-in demand and minimize patient waiting times. So the way we solved this problem, we first solved an optimization model. Then we said, well, let's, is there a heuristic that's near optimal? We did. Then we used a simulation model to evaluate and see how well our heuristic would work. So simulated things. Um, so we've implemented this. So we formalized instructions for implementing the heuristic. Uh, and then we created a paper-based flow diagram and the uh, nurses who schedule the infusion center are using it. And what we're doing now, we look at, well, how did the schedule get improved? So this is just like a schematic of the schedule with, with different beds and how they're being used during the day. Um, and then we provide feedback and additional training to the schedulers. So this is a project that's been implemented. And in fact, if you heard what I was saying, it's also been sustained, it's still being used. So. That's a little bit about implementation. Now, what about sustained use? Suppose you've solved the problem and it's been implemented. Let's talk about that. So I mentioned that uh, one of the projects was predicting surgical case lengths. The way we currently do it is the procedure durations are estimated by the surgeons. We asked them, how do you do it? This is the slide they sent us. Indiana Jones with his crystal. That's how we estimate it. So we decided to uh, use machine learning to predict surgical case length. We used a variety of machine learning methods. And we also looked at, did the surgeon's procedure length estimate matter? Uh, we found out that uh, our, we tried a bunch of different machine learning methods. Uh, turned out the surgeon's estimate was the most important thing, but there were other things that also mattered, like which surgeon, right? Some people may over or underestimate what procedure type, the weight and age of the child. So this is a project that we were able to successfully uh, finish uh, and we did implement it. And the way it worked is email alerts were sent if the machine learning forecast differed significantly from the surgeon's forecast. So they'd get a text message. Then these forecasts would be reviewed manually. So we know how to do this. We have machine learning. We can tell the surgeon, oh, you know, we've got a different estimate. And then we look at it manually. Then we adjust the schedule manually. Well, the problem is there's a lot of effort required to do this and many alerts were for short cases. So in this case, although we implemented it, the project was not sustained. Uh, now a project that was sustained was in managing surgical supplies. So the way surgery works is you have preference cards that say, here is what you need for this surgery, put all these things on this cart, bring it into the operating room. Um, of course, cards aren't always accurate because you never know exactly what you'll need. And if you don't have the right card, you may have uh, surgical delays while someone runs out to get the supplies, or you may have wasted supplies that you brought in and opened that you don't need. Uh, so we decided to do inventory analysis using our electronic health record. We looked at um, surgical preference cards and how often were there necessary items missing from the preference cards? And how often were there unnecessary items included on the preference cards? Um, we developed a fully data-driven tool using the electronic health record. And nurses can then look and accept, reject, or modify the suggested changes to the preference card. We did a case-controlled study and we found that on average, we added seven items and removed five items on average per card. Um, and over the period for which, over which we measured it, there were significant cost savings. And this is used in a sustained way. Uh, so this is a project where we've successfully sustained the use. So I've talked about the four stages that we believe are related to um, sustained use and success. I'd like to now talk about our lessons that we've learned. So 
in solving the technical problem, uh, really important to choose the model that fits the problem and the data. I think obtaining data is always a challenge. When I talked about um, for uh, about these projects, I glossed over the huge amount of work that was required to get the data into the proper form. Like it took my student a year to get the data for the operating room scheduling pro project uh, in, in the form that we need. Um, we were trying to predict rare events and they're often, that's a hard thing to do, we found out. Uh, I think it's really important to be willing to pivot uh, and maybe instead of predicting and solving the huge optimization problem, just focus on understanding and visualizing the data. We've been, we found that was pretty successful. We also found sometimes more than one model is needed. So I talked about the operating room scheduling where we have machine learning, we have optimization, we have simulation. Uh, also, sometimes you can test multiple models. So we tried different machine learning models. That would be an example. Uh, in terms of implementing the solution, I think before you even start work, it's really important to understand how the model will be implemented and involve key staff members in doing that. Um, really important to have the appropriate technical partners for implementation. Uh, we actually, well, this being Silicon Valley, many of our students like to go start companies. So we have students who started companies to support some of the analytics that the hospital does. Very important to have people who can help you. Um, Another thing we found, in, at least in the hospital, you want to disrupt as few workflows as possible. So that's why the uh, scorecard thing worked. I mean, the um, um, preference cards uh, project worked well. It didn't interrupt any workflows. Um, in our case, and, and probably in any organization, you have to understand the technical constraints. Like what data can you get? How can you change decisions? Um, and then I think, also in implementation, we found that successful projects are often implemented in stages. Like you understand the data, then you create a dashboard, then you optimize. So biting off small bits at a time. In terms of sustaining the implementation, it's really important to build partnerships at the project start. And this was mentioned in the previous talk as well, that you really need at the very beginning to get people involved. Um, as I mentioned, successful projects have to align with institutional priorities. Um, think continual feedback and incentives are needed. So the, the, um, the people developing the model need continual feedback and the people implementing the model have to see that it's in their interest to do so. Um, we've also found that automated systems have an advantage because you don't have to have a person sitting there doing it. Uh, We've done a number of projects that are just one-time process redesign and they tend to be sustained. Uh, and as I mentioned, project, the, the improvement or the performance of a project is very important. If, if you can't point to anything that changed, then you can't really um, defend the usefulness of such techniques. So some concluding thoughts. Um, I think there are many opportunities to include improve healthcare value using analytical tools. We can use these tools to improve decisions about design and delivery of healthcare, uh, you know, exploiting available data. Analytical tools can capture system complexity and help us optimize system performance. But it's very important that the tools be designed to achieve sustained value. You know, healthcare lags decades behind other in industries in terms of operational analytics. And I think that to date, analytics-based system design has really failed to provide the full benefits that could be achieved. I think that I would hope that operations researchers can use the lessons of many failures, including some of our own, which I just talked about, to inform the design, implementation, and evaluation of improved analytical solutions. So uh, the work I've just talked about today has just, we published it this year in the INFORMS Journal on Applied Analytics. So all of the details of what I talked about is uh, in that um, article. So thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions.